Welcome. This is Tuesday, April 13th. This is the uh, Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives. And we are looking at, today we are looking at S-16, an act relating to the creation of the Task Force on School Exclusionary Discipline Reform. And we have an update that we want to take a look at. And our Ledge Council, Mr. Jim Damore, could walk us through that. That would be okay. quick. Yeah. Um, great. Let's pull this up. Okay, so for the rec record, uh, Jim Damer, Les Consul, we are walking through a bit bigger on um, uh, draft 1.1. Of your draft amendment to S16, uh, uh, which deals with the task force on school exclusionary discipline reform. Um, what is changed from the underlying bill it is highlighted in yellow. So I'll just scroll through until we see yellow. Um, <clears throat> So here we are on section two. We have a change in the name, <coughs> name of the task force. It's now named Task Force on Equitable and Inclusive School Environments. Um, and then the next change is on membership. The underlying bill, you may recall, had the secretary appointing 20 members uh, of, of the task force um, among various categories, like educators, administrators, various categories of, um, of uh, people. This actually names the members of the task force. So we have 19 members. Um, you have the Secretary of Education, Commissioner of Mental Health, and then the V's, um, and all of these are, um, are or designee. So uh, you have the V's coming down to here, H. And then you have one member appointed by the Legal Aid Disability Law Project, one member appointed by the Vermont Family Network, one member appointed by BEST, one member appointed by the National Center on Restorative Justice at the Vermont Law School. Uh, two teachers appointed by the Vermont NEA. Uh, one uh, member appointed by the ACLU of Vermont. One member of the Therapeutic School appointed by the Vermont Independent Schools Association. Uh, one school counselor appointed by the Vermont School Counselor Association. Uh, and two high school students appointed by the Vermont Principals Association. Um, the membership uh, shall be di uh, racially diverse. Um, and then in terms of powers and duties, uh, they're basically the same. Uh, it's been a change in uh, on line 10. So it's to review uh, current behavioral supports and in, in school services. So the current behavioral supports and uh, was added. Um, going down to D, we have um, a new duty, which is to review school professional development programs and make recommendations on how educator practices, such as positive behavioral interventions and support, trauma-informed practices, and restorative practices, and related training for these practices can increase educators' awareness of students' social, emotional needs in a manner to reduce their behaviors that lead to possible out-of-school disciplinary measures. And then we have conforming changes. Conforming uh, changes. Conforming changes. Um, conforming change. 
And then down to the next section, the appropriation has been reduced from about 15,000 to 8,000 uh, because your membership has been defined and the number of the members uh, are the V's and the secretary who don't receive compensation. Um, and then um, we just have conforming changes here. And then here on um, uh, section six, um, earlier it had read um, that a student enrolled in a public school who is, I think it was in the eighth grade uh, or under, now it's uh, eight years of age, uh, under eight years of age, uh, shall not be suspended or expelled from the school, provided, however, that the school may suspend or expel the student if the student poses a threat of harm or danger to others in the school. So it's really the addition of, of suspended here uh, as well as expulsion. And this is unchanged. The effective date is unchanged but the title of the act would change um, to the Task Force on Equitable and Inclusive School Environments. And that is it. Thank you. I know we have some uh, people in here who'd like to hear from, from you. Um, I see Justa Careless is here from the agency and Wendy Geller and David Kelly are here um and looking for your response i don't know who wants to speak thank you so much chair webb this is uh wendy geller uh, i will turn my video on in just a second i just have Sol in here with me at the moment um he's just awake from his nap so sorry about that everybody um i think he just couldn't wait to to see everybody again <laughs> we're the education committee we we accept children <laughs> thank you um so I, uh, we, we took your, um, your, your uh, comment back uh, last time where we kind of walked you through all the materials that are on the web. Um, you had mentioned that uh, it would be helpful to um, really just dig into the bill. So we did try to do that this time. Uh, we submitted some materials and the testimony and I figured I would, um, I would drive this time. And uh, oh, it says uh, the host has disabled participant screen sharing. Um, could I could I please yeah. have permission to? You got it. You got it now. Okay. Thank you. Um, bear with me just one moment while I pull this up. Okay. Let's see here. Can everybody see my screen here? Yes. A, okay. So this is the testimony that was um, just submitted. So we're just going to walk through this here. Um, let me just scroll this down because this is really the. Um, uh, most uh, specific uh, section. So I figured we could just walk through this here together. Um, we put together a, a table. Uh, I love tables. Um, and um, thank you very much to Director DeCarolis for all the order and um, logic that she uh, applied to this. Uh, it was extremely uh, critical to our ability to put this together for you all. Um, so we, we do have a couple of factual clarifications that we thought would be helpful as you go through this markup and then some recommendations for consideration. Uh, so you just read the table left to right. Um, so there's a, just a hot link to the, to the drafted language in case that's helpful for folks to have everything that is, um, you know, it's just connected in one document. Uh, so this is section one. Uh, so from the, the standpoint of factual clarification, uh, we, you know, as you all saw last time, uh, discipline data are reported publicly through the snapshot and the VED. Uh, so we have some recommended language here for your consideration um, in that they are made available annually. Um, and then from 7A, uh, it's, it's really just a, a, another clarification uh, for where those data live on the web already. Uh, and then um, some suggested language here in that it notes the two places where, where those data live. Um, and then it specifies the ways in which those data are reported. Uh, there is another, and I realize we're kind of cut between these two uh, pages here, but um, we have then B and uh, we start uh, that column here. The annual snapshot reports disciplinary exclusions as one of its measures. 
this indicator reflects the amount of school days missed as a result of out of school suspensions relative to the number of students enrolled during the school year selected. Um, and just a, a note about this language, this is actually how it reads on the annual snapshot itself for consistency's sake. Um, and then there's some suggested language uh, here that you could consider. Okay, so B says that it's not readily available and you've got information that it actually is. Is that right? Is that yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah. And this is a live link. I realize that, you know, it won't be live in the legislation itself, but yeah, I, I just appreciate having things in one place. So we figured you, you might too. So do we. <laughs> um, um, Representative Austin, wait one question. Yes, Austin. I just want to clarify one thing, Dr. Geller. Um, I, I believe it was uh, I, I believe it was you that gave us testimony uh, earlier that is some data that cannot be presented publicly, but that districts have access to it. Yes, ma'am. And so, in a sense, it's true that not all data uh, the public has access to. Um, I don't know if there needs to be a rationale for that or some explanation as to why that is, or if it's somewhere else in your presentation. Um, we do have some suggested language for your consideration around um, to the extent, uh, let's see, let me just scroll to it because it'll be easier if we can all just see it. Um, let me see here. There is some language around um, to the extent that uh, uh, as permissible under existing reporting and collecting rules and procedures, um, that's a reference to both the rules and procedures around how, how we are um, directed to collect and manage these data, as well as store these data, um, and, and then to share these data. So uh, that's, that's really a reference to the Family uh, Educational Rights and Privacy Act, FERPA. Right. That's, so is, is that helpful, or do you feel like yeah, that really no, needs no, a... That, that's helpful, and I probably should have waited to the end of your explanation, your presentation, to ask. Uh, I'll wait until this oh, is no problem. Thank you. No um, problem at all. Representative Brady, related to this section? Yeah, thank you. When So we're on, I, I've been through the bill with a fine tooth comb, so I'm trying to keep track really carefully of what we're looking at here. Sure. Thing. So it says, um, so you're, you're in the findings here and that you do have this discipline data. And so then if I open the Vermont education dashboard, <laughs> and want to look at some of that data. I just wanna make sure I'm not missing something. When I put in say a fifth grade free and reduced lunch, I get measures on, um, it doesn't tell me numbers. It, it gives me the, uh, where we are. Uh, let me pull it up in front of me again. It, am I looking at the wrong thing that I don't see at? actual numbers of students, I see a, uh, a sort of score on our proficiency towards that. Now uh, the link to the, the Sorry. snapshot. Yeah. Yes. Um, so all of the data behind the snapshot are exportable. Um, that was the Excel uh, file that uh, uh, Chief Kelly, uh, Dave Kelly is here with me today, my research and sec right. stat section chief. That was the file that he walked everybody through. Um, the, the data that are in the snapshot, obviously for public consumption, do have to also have suppression procedures uh, applied to them. Um, but they are certainly, insofar as the data that are publicly shareable, um, as well as notes whether or not they have to be suppressed, um, that information is in that export file as well. Um, so you can certainly, I, I realize that the, um, the filled in circles, I think, is yeah, what you're referring to. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so under the requirements for ESSA, uh, the the depiction of how have how our various schools and systems were doing relative to our goals uh, needed to be a, a simplified system, um, which is where some of the um, imagery came from in, in how the snapshot displays. But yeah. there's there's definitely an export feature where you can get at the data that are behind that platform. I guess I, so if we're looking at um, under seven uh, B, where it 
our, our version of the bill right now says some relevant data is not readily available from the Vermont AOE, such as the total number of days missed by students. I, I appreciate your point and with a lot of help and digging that you could get to those numbers, but it doesn't seem to me that that would be a mischaracterization to say it's not readily available. If I was a concerned parent in Rutland, I don't feel like I could navigate this and get to some numbers or something that would tell me more than just how much that circle's filled in. Uh, we can certainly take that back to the uh, that feedback back to the um, to the vendor. Uh, the export functionality is is readily available there. Um, I don't know the degree to which we can um, adjust the platform in um, in any immediate sense. Uh, but I can certainly take that feedback back to uh, the vendor on that piece. Yeah, I guess I'm just wondering, is it, it, does it really hurt to have, you know, I see maybe the discrepancy with the language in A, that they don't, we don't publicly report, but to say that some of it's not readily available, not to cast blame on Vermont AOE, but I think it does create some important purpose and work behind this bill. Mm -hmm. I don't know how um, others on here are reading that, but. I think that the, how we interpreted readily available is that it is not, you cannot get it um, in any short order. Uh, the export functionality is, is, is live, has been live for quite some time. And we have a data request process where um, folks, the, the general public, uh, mm -hmm. if, if there are ever any questions about these data or where they come from, you just contact us through that and we help folks find it. So I, I think, I think I hear you in the in the um, question about how we're interpreting ready, um, but I would recommend that um, there are existing supports and staff uh, who are dedicated to making sure that folks can can get at those data and find them, um, and then also know how to use them. Yeah. So the okay. data does exist. I think is is one of the things that we're we're noting. And I see uh, just a careless. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Jessica Carolus, for the record, uh, Division Director, Agency of Education. I, I think to Representative Brady's point, um, but also addressing this tension, which is, I, I think with the developer, the focus often is, particularly with our website, because I, I think the Agency of Education can own that we can sometimes be uh, um, guilty of this, is making sure that representing the data was easily consumable um, by the general public. And I think that was the default. But what I'm hearing Representative Brady right, say, is, right. right? So it's always like, if it's too complex, then it's not accessible. But what I'm right. hearing is that perhaps it's too simplified uh, in this regard to get at some of the nuance. And, and what I think um, Dr. Geller and I can do is maybe put our heads together to think about whether there could even just be some readily accessible language on the website to tell people how to download the CSV file so they can access that information. I don't know if, if that okay. would be helpful for folks. I'm going to, I'm going to start to move us a little bit here because we're still just on. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, everyone can still see my screen. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not quite accustomed to working in team or uh, working in, in zoom. So you're doing great. Trying. Okay. <laughs> Super. All right. So we're just going to scroll down here now. Um, to see. Uh, we do have some uh, factual clarifications and additional material that are that is here from the program folks uh, in, in what is currently uh, the, the case around whether or not uh, relevant data are maintained by us um, here at the AOE. So this is from our program partners in the Student Support Services Division. Uh, they have advised us that uh, Title 16 uh, says that they're, they're authorized and encouraged to do so, but we don't have a, an explicit requirement um, outside of federal requirements around um, related services that are written into the IP for students who are served through special education. Um, so there is a note um, around uh, consecutive versus cumulative. Uh, and then there is there is a note from our program folks that discuss how there's no other guidance about educational services um, or provision to collect data as to whether there are any other services other than those related to those IEP that are, are um, provided. Uh, 
So the, the next uh, factual clarification, I think that's really important for folks to know um, is a, the, the discussion about the civil rights data collection, or we, we refer to it as the CRDC. Um, so this, and, and, and we have provided the exact language from um, the Office of Civil Rights CRDC uh, webpage. Um, this is what's called a direct collection, um, which means that this is a collection that the federal government manages directly with the, the LEAs on the ground. Um, and so we really don't have a role. We, as in the AOE, the SEA, does not have a role uh, in this collection. Um, and we, um, so we are not involved, I guess, is the best way to, to say that. It's, it's managed at the federal level. Um, and so we really wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't want to comment about the, the uh, Office of Civil Rights data collection practices and the accuracy uh, of their, um, of this collection. Uh, it has been running since 1968. Uh, not in its uh, exactly the same form. It has evolved over time, uh, but it is a very long-standing collection, uh, and it has uh, certainly been seminal to quite a number of uh, very important uh, civil rights um, pieces of legislation, policy guidance, rules, et cetera, um, throughout its, its long history. So um, we do have some suggested language that you could consider here uh, because these are a direct collection. Um, and there is some resources that we've provided here in the factual clarifications uh, column. Uh, if you care to, to read a little more uh, about it, if you wanna dig in a little deeper. Um, so just provide those there in the middle column. Uh, and then we move on to number eight, uh, more data on school discipline plaque practices, excuse me, uh, is necessary to understand strategies around that. Uh, and so this moves down to B here. And then we have some suggested language that notes, um, you know, could be the designee of the secretary who might be a part of the membership of the group. Yeah, I was uh, actually thinking about that, that maybe that, that would definitely uh, reduce the, the number if we said, you know, mm -hmm. that they, the, the, the commission, the executive director or designee would reduce the number. Is that what you're saying? Um, we we uh, we just thought that maybe there 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 might want to be a designee for the secretary. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. Um, and then we we did suggest the inclusion of the uh, SU or and or school data managers in this group. Okay. Um, you know, data are, a, are an organization-wide effort. Um, and, and these, they're cer it's certainly not just the work of the data folks. Um, you know, indeed folks all across the organization engage with the student information system. And, and it's critical that they are uh, a part of how we build a culture of data quality. Um, but these are also the folks who understand the nitty gritty around um, how you define an element will really matter in terms of what it will be, um, what its strengths and weaknesses will be and, and how you can use it. Um, so we thought that this might be a, a group of folks who might have some knowledge and expertise that could potentially be valuable to the work. Just school business officers or it might not be? Um, it might not be, it kind of depends. We see a lot of variation all across the state with who the folks are that um, that fill a role like this. Uh, but it's it's kind of up to the, the, the SU and the school as to which member of their personnel ends up filling this type of a role. Okay. Representative Brady, no? Okay. So we'll just scroll down here to the powers and duties. Uh, let's see. Uh, so we've we've just noted the inclusion of the existing data that are there uh, through the, the tools and platforms that are on the web already, uh, so that they're included with the YRBS. And then on E, uh, we've recommended using the available data uh, and then surveying the SUs on their local data collection processes 
regarding how they collect and manage uh, school suspensions and expulsion data so that that could help inform the work of the task force. Um, so just scrolling down again to two. Uh, so in, in terms of um, some factual clarifications here, we thought you might be interested uh, in the, um, well, in the fact that with regard to the requ required reporting on the reason for an incident. Um, so in this case, we're giving an example of if it was motivated by race or religion or sexual orientation. Uh, currently that information is collected in that variable called category in the existing um, SEERS data, uh, data files that are submitted as part of the year-end collection. But it's important to know that these data are only collected for harassment incidents. Mm -hmm. And the data collection system would require quite substantial development work and field training to collect this for all reported incidents. Um, so when I it see, comes to, whoops, sorry, go ahead. I just see Jessica Carolus. You want to finish that sentence and I want to make sure that she has a chance to weigh in. Oh, yeah. I was just going to get into how it works within the collection itself. But go ahead, Jess, uh, Director De Carolus. Yeah, no, go ahead. When you, why don't you finish and then I'll, I'll just comment because there was a section above too. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so when it does come to those expulsion data, this type of event, it's not often reportable here in Vermont because it happens so seldomly um, on an annual basis. So from, from a, and by reportable, I mean reporting publicly. Um, so historically, that number has been fewer than 10 incidents across the entire state on an annual basis. Uh, our our um, suppression level is 11. So um, that's just a, a, a piece of factual information that folks might want to know about. Um, so uh, then we have the note on the education data on education services during an exclusion. Uh, they are not collected on suspension, uh, but what we do see in the data is that the majority of those suspensions are between one and three days, and it might be difficult to stand up alternative services quickly in that short of a time period. Um, particularly in the case of those out of school uh, suspensions. So uh, just another note that they are collected whenever connected to a student with an IEP for the federal requirement. Um, Jess, do you wanna jump in there? Sure, and would you mind just going back up to uh, section E real quick? Yep. I, I think one, one note, um, particularly around this, this language around mm -hmm. compiling on a school district and approved independent school basis, the available data is just a, a caution when we're talking about compiling, because the agency already does comp collect and compile uh, these data and in accordance with you know, rules governing appropriate uh, collection met methodology and FERPA is, is to maybe clarify that. And I think that that language that we've offered is just thinking about a, a, a separate non-governmental body, perhaps engaging in data collection at a even school level basis, particularly if you even have students who are sitting on this and, and making sure that we're adhering to FERPA and protecting the privacy of students. And then I think just generally for sections two through four, um, what you'll see is, is just language cautioning that particularly when it comes to this intersection of, you know, the sort of civil or criminal or juvenile justice systems in education, that we're making sure that we're not uh, engaging in behaviors that might be counter to some of the, the collections or rules governing those systems, particularly I'm thinking about the juvenile justice system, which is by design, a lot of that, those records are non-public. So we, we just wanted to make a note there. Um, and I think we've offered some language, but obviously, um, you know, there'll be other input from other folks. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Jess. Thank you. Um, so there is just that language about the uh, as permissible under existing reporting and collecting rules and procedures. Um, so to Jess's point, um, I think you've covered those bits. Jess, do we want to spend any more time on those pieces or try to crack on some more time for? Well, let's crack on. Okay. Uh, so then under F um, about uh, recommended changes, um, we have adjusted that to say recommended additions because our data collection practices are guided by the federal standards and requirements. Um, and so while uh, there's certainly room to discuss recommended additions for the types of data collected, uh, we, we really need to make sure that we're gonna maintain adherence to, our, to the expectations that the federal government um, has for us, the requirements um, that they have for us around uh, collection management and reporting. Uh, and let me see here. 
and um, we've just noted the uh, needing to to be in accordance with those federal and state rules and best practice around governing appropriate data collection and reporting. Um, so uh, certainly room for conversation about additions, uh, but ensuring that we're adhering to best practices uh, and making sure we can fulfill our, our requirements. Uh, there yes, is, is, that, is, that a, is that a new a new comment? Or is that, I'm just seeing your hand up. And Jess, I'm just gonna invite you to just speak. <laughs> oh, sorry, I, I forgot to lower my hand. Yeah. Okay, just, just, just go ahead and speak at this great, point perfect. while we're going through this chart. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so then moving down, uh, we, we did suggest uh, pushing out the timeline a little bit to give this uh, task force ample time to, to do this important and thoughtful work. Uh, so that suggestion is just here. You'll see in the, in the third column on the right. Yeah, and Wendy, I'll, I'll just jump in real quick because I, I think if we do push this out and, and particularly in reflecting on some of the conversations we even had this morning, thinking about... Um, testimony we've heard from the Act One work group is, is uh, you know, just understanding that with these really sort of thorny, complex, incredibly important issues, particularly as they pertain to equity, it's just giving a long enough on-ramp for folks to navigate those complexities, to make sure that they're um, being informed by all of the information they need. But by changing that date, there will likely be implications for thinking about, I think you had some uh, recommendations for number of meeting times, there might be implications for whatever the compensation pattern might be. So we didn't actually sort of spell that out because we just put this forward as a recommendation, mm -hmm. um, but wanted to signal that there would be implications in other areas. Okay. So then in section four, this is really just to align the, um, the, the secretary or the designee uh, and then it's also to provide some suggested language around giving some room for uh, the, the folks here at the Ed to be able to give um, essentially a training um, on what's available, where it comes from, what its strengths and limitations are, how you use it, uh, and then um, to, to give folks a chance to, to really understand those data and what you can know from them. Um, as well as what you can't know from them, where their limitations are, and how they're used. Uh, so that's that's something from a from a data perspective that's really critical for folks. Um, so so sense. essentially, data literacy. <laughs> so um, okay, so we'll just move on to B. Let me see. Uh, so we just added some some suggestions here around uh, the need for evaluating. Um, and then potentially adding some, some rules uh, uh, governing reporting uh, around that. And then uh, kind of incorporating what would come out of the task force analysis of those extant and publicly shareable data. Um, and then down here, uh, providing some suggested language around some room for recommendations. Uh, and then uh, just again acknowledging that we have you know guardrails that we have to operate within with regard to um, federal data collection and reporting rules and requirements. Um, Jess, did I did I miss anything here? I know nope, sometimes I'm it. a little too far in the weeds. Um, so I will just stop sharing now. All right. Thank you. That's a lot. <laughs> I'm much more used to teams, so. Yes, and probably I think as I just did with literacy, um, Aaron might um, suggest that uh, you do the same thing and maybe work with um, Jess and, and Ledge Council and maybe someone from the field um, looking at uh, where we want to go. With these changes. Um, I, I, hearing this, I think the idea of making sure that the group has a training on the data sounds like a really good idea. Um, Representative James. Thank you, Chair Webb. Um, I am not sure uh, precisely who this question is for, so I'll just toss it out there. Um, and I'm sorry I didn't 
pick up on this a couple of days ago, but um, the bill starts out with um, some national findings and then sort of moves to those Vermont level findings that are available. And while I realize that findings don't you know, go into statute, they do set intent. And um, one thing I know is that nationally, um, LGBTQ plus and gender non-conforming students also experience um, disproportionately higher rates of um, school disciplinary action. And um, that's pretty well documented. So I don't see that reflected in the bill at, at all. And I wonder if, because I know we have low numbers in Vermont, we have a lot of gaps in our data. So I am wondering one, whether we feel that that's not the case in Vermont, which I doubt, or two, whether we feel that we should at least um, mention this in the findings and three, whether you feel that um, the bill maybe sufficiently mentions that point. I, I do know that you know, sexual identity and gender orientation is one of the data points that we're asking them to look at. But I, I just have noticed sort of a big difference between um, how this, you know, group of students fares nationally, according to the stats, and then sort of the lack of that data here and the lack of that mentioned in our bill. Thanks. So I can speak to, um, I can speak to the existing data collection in that we do have, um, we do have data on whether or not the, the, the incident was uh, something related to a protected class. Um, and so that is for harassment uh, data. Um, as far as collecting data on individual students, um, sexual identities or, or, or um, gender identities or orientation, uh, we do not currently collect uh, those type of data. Um, the, there would be some there would be some discussion I think we would have to have with the task force around the ethics of um, collecting and storing those types of data on, on, on minors. Um, so I, I think that there's, there's discussion that could be certainly had uh, in that area. Um, from, a, from an infrastructural standpoint, there would have to be some pretty substantial adjustments made to current data collection um, and management infrastructure. Uh, to, to accommodate a new element like that. Um, and then certainly some pretty significant training for folks in the field who are collecting uh, and reporting data like these. Um, but uh, I, I, I believe that the extant data around um, uh, this topic is largely uh, reported through the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. Um, and I think that the the strength and the utility of a collection mechanism like that is because it is, um, it is, you know, anonymous for lack of a, a, a better turn of phrase. Uh, and so it, um, the, the risk to students' privacy uh, is, is certainly a lot lower uh, than when you kind of talk about collections that we manage, which are by their definition, um, they're really census level collections. Um, so, uh, does that does that help with the the, the discussion? Oh, um, I mean, I guess I'm wondering. I you know, I'm I'm seeing I'm seeing this data sort of reported at the national level. I mean, I you know, I just went to sort of Google this and and saw that the three groups of students most likely to experience exclusionary discipline are. Um, uh, black students, students with disabilities, and LGBTQ students. So that that seems to be readily available at the national level. And I, I thought in Act One we were, um, and maybe you mentioned this earlier, but I, I thought as a result of Act One we were starting to gather um, hazing, harassment, and bullying info on LGBTQ students, among many other groups, right? So that's different. Uh, so we certainly right now collect data on an incident that is related to, uh, you know, a student's orientation or uh, race or ethnicity. Um, we, we certainly collect data like that. Um, it, the difference is that um, we are not collecting data on whether or not the student themselves identifies that way. 
uh, we're collecting data on whether the incident was related to a topic like that. Um, so for example, if there was to be a student who used a slur against another student, uh -huh. and that was a, a slur that was related to um, LGBTQ plus uh, folks, um, it's the, the data that are being collected is whether or not the, the slur happened mm -hmm. about a protected class and not about whether or not the student who um, experienced that event is or is not of that protect, protected class. It's just whether or not the event is related to that protected class. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, I'll, uh, I, I guess I'm just thinking um, that if the national stats bear out here in Vermont, um, and that's a group of students that's also disproportionately experiencing um, school discipline and suspensions and stuff that we would want to know that? I would have to look at the material that you're taking a look at to see, you know, what the source is uh, to, to get really into the, the collection um, logistics or um, how we would implement something like that. Okay. Uh, I think there's plenty of room for discussion. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to let you know what we do and we don't do right now. So maybe that's just something for the task force to make sure that the task force looks at that. That's something we can we can discuss. Um, Representative Austin. Yes, thank you. I'm just going back to section D um, on page seven, and I, you know, I'm a little concerned about I'm trying to think where it is. Um, the word serious, um, and I think it's in there. I have it down on D. Uh, anyway, uh, I think serious is too broad a word in terms of when we're looking at behaviors. I, I wonder if we need to define the behaviors or um, I think it's when students do get expelled or suspended, it's due to serious behavior, but how people define serious behavior is pretty broad. And I'm just wondering, um, at least my experience with kids being expelled or suspended was 90% of the time was due to unsafe behavior to themselves or to other kids. Um, and I'm just wondering if we should use that or use serious and or unsafe to self and others. I'm sorry, um, Sarita, where are you? I'm on page seven. <laughs> Um, sorry. What line? Repre is this Representative Austin? Is this under the powers and duties the task force shall for all but the most serious student behaviors? Where, where are you? I'm oh, sorry. Okay. I see where you are. Okay. You're on D power. There you go. Okay. On page six. Okay. Is that right? Sorry. I thought I wrote it down. Uh, yes. Uh, under power, powers and duties. The task force shall make recommendations to end suspensions and expulsions for all but the most serious student behaviors. I wonder if serious is, I don't know if it should be unsafe or serious and or unsafe. Uh, I mean, well, I further down, further down there, it does say define the most serious behaviors. Go down to line 20. Oh, okay. Sorry, I kind of, I just, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And then the other one is um, I'm a little concerned. And I, you know, I'd be interested to hear what Representative Brady thinks about this concern. Uh, this is D on page seven. Um, review school professional development programs and make recommendations on how educator practices, such as, you know, and then it lists off some interventions um, that can increase educators' awareness of students' social emotional needs in a manner to reduce these behavior. You know, I, I, I've always like felt as an educator, I don't kind of um, diagnose why a student is behaving a certain way. I begin asking questions like, what is getting in the way of the student 
you know, uh, you know, accessing skills and knowledge to be able to stay in school. So, I mean, to automatically say it's social emotional, it could be a lot of things other than social emotional, it could be a lot of other reasons. And I'm concerned that um, that's, that's, that we're already identifying and diagnosing what the, pro the concerns of the student is. I mean, they could have attention deficit disorder, they could have a physical disorder, they could have, um, you know, is, there could a a change, is there a change that you would want to make in the way this is written, Representative Austin? Um, <laughs> yes, but I need to think about it uh, before. Can I explain a little bit? Yep. So that language was added in this version and that language came from, so they can jump in and help me out, a, a combination of um, Jeff Fannin at NEA and yeah. from the folks at the BEST Project, it was trying to meld together similar ideas that we heard consistently from folks around trying to put some uh, positive action into this bill too, of what we do want to do, not what we, not just what we don't want to do. We don't, we want to stop excluding kids, but we want to have better practices in schools that support students and therefore minimize, minimize these kind of um, consequences. And so that seemed like the best place to put in a nod to things like PBIS, um, emotion, uh, trauma-informed practices, and that the more a system is trained around those, that hopefully is also leading to fewer of what we're trying to get rid of here. So I don't know if that's the perfect place for it. That was my suggestion, trying to pull together language that was pretty similar from Jeff Fannin and from folks that we heard at UVM that had some pretty compelling testimony, I thought. so. In terms of context, that's why that's there. Maybe it's not hitting the mark. Jeff Fannin's in the room, so. Yeah. It, uh, I, I think Representative Brady uh, did a great job in explaining it, but uh, Representative Austin, the, the attempt here from, I raised it when I testified a week and a half ago, whatever it was, Representative Brady contacted me. I tried to put some language together. I spoke with a couple of um, educators and we, we kicked it around a little bit. So it, it is work by committee and obviously the best, uh, the folks at UVM also weighed in, I guess, too. So when you write by committee, it's, oh, you know, there's probably a little bit of uh, language streamlining that could be done, certainly. But the idea is to make sure that educators have some training so that they can avoid these, you know, the, the things that they might do that wouldn't alter behavior a little bit earlier on to avoid these re end results. Uh, that's the aim, is PD for educators and what I was talking about, so that um, we can uh, we can avoid and reduce the number of out of school suspensions. We don't think that's you know stepping back. That's not a good thing, for, and I think we all agree on that. Right. So how do we avoid it? And the notion there is giving tools, better tools, to educators to avoid those end results. Right. My my concern is that it may not be social emotional. You know, it could be something's going on with the student at home. Um, I, I guess that would be social emotional, but it could also be a, a physical, biological uh, thing. And I just wouldn't want that to go undiagnosed, you know, or untreated um, because, you know, you're assuming that it's social emotional, maybe not biological. So- um, Isn't that what response to intervention is now? I mean, you could take you could take out the phrase that splits between line four and line five can increase educators' awareness of social emotional needs, and I think the full intent is still there that we're right. reviewing how well interventions, trauma informed practices, restorative practices related PBIS I think was in there at one point whether we put it in or not in order to reduce behaviors. Right. No, I agree with that. Um, I agree with that, Erin. I was thinking that too. If you took out, I don't, I don't know that it makes a huge difference either way, but again, the, the nod was trying to hear to get at that this task force isn't just looking at like 10 expulsions, but is looking at pra systems wide practices and shifts that will also have academic gains, coincidentally, but also that, you know, are going to improve overall school climate and behavior issues and, and the whole host of things the bill is dealing with. Likely from the task force makeup, that's going to come up anyway. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. If I if I may, Madam Chair, um, it, Representative Austin, I, I don't know. You know, you seem to stumble or, or uh, have issues with the social. You know, the focus on social emotional needs. 
as it, well, because there I, may be other needs that sir so, so if you were to drop the two words social emotional right just look at students needs right that's what i was thinking so that it's you know it people will be looking be questioning like what what's getting in the student's way so, um, if, we, so if we strike if we i'm going to keep this moving if we yeah. strike social emotional then that would get to the get to the issue at hand and make yeah. you feel more comfortable that we're not diagnosing yes. of Austin. Do you feel that is uh, is that okay with the committee? Yep. I mean, that's what I'm asking. I'm not seeing any hesitancy, so we'll we'll take that out for the next iteration. Okay. Um, we have a lot of information that just came in from the agency, <laughs> um, and I, I would appreciate Representative Brady if you could work. With, with the AOE and um, Jim Damaray and um, I don't know if we need uh, one of the V's perhaps to, to have I, I would, yeah, I would really love to have at least one other educator, somebody in the field perspective, whether that's the V's, whether that's, um, but I, I, I feel a little uncomfortable doing it in a vacuum with right. AOE since- I agree. You know where the data is and understand it. I'm struggling to access the data and I'm a vested party here. And then there's the schools that are actually doing this. So I think that it's important that we have that voice. Do we have someone volunteering to, to help with that? Is that a principal or a teacher or be better? I'm not seeing either of you volunteering. At the <laughs> I understand it's nobody wants to take on more. Yeah, no, I, I, I will do it. I, I think Jay's better equipped in so many ways. Yeah. He's so talented as Jay. <laughs> um, but I, I, will, I will pinch hit and rely on Jay as a, a consultant in the background. How's that? Okay, that would be great. I support that, that move. Okay, that would be great. And it, you can work on that. And, and we may not be able to get to until next week, but we'll, if you could work, if you could work on it this week, that would be great. And Jesse, maybe you can help with setting something like that up. And this question, if you want to start with, start with your own Zoom there, <laughs> Representative Brady. Um, other comments on the bill so far from the field? Um, yeah. Jay Nichols. Yeah, so just, just a few things. Um, <clears throat> first of all, good work. Um, thanks for making the changes that specify the composition of the task force, um, as we had previ previously suggested. I love the change to equitable and inclusive school environments. That also goes to what Jeff uh, Hannon was talking about, trying to frame things in a more positive light. Um, I also want to thank you especially for adding the position of a special education administrator from BCSEA on the task force. I think that's going to be really important. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we're making, we're making sure that we're taking care of all kids and kids with disabilities need to be really thought of as we go through this process. Uh, additionally, additionally, VPA will work closely with school leaders to appoint two high school students to the task force if that language remains in the bill. Um, I also like the addition to the work of the task force on reviewing school professional development programs including PBIS and trauma-informed practices that are already in place in many Vermont schools. I think that's a nice touch. Um, if Sarita would like to talk about that for the next three hours with all of us, I'd be glad to do that too. Um, that, I'm kidding, Sarita. You're on Zoom. <laughs> uh, the one change that I mentioned before, and I wanna make sure I share again, and I did send it in writing to um, you, Chair Webb, and to uh, Representatives Conlin and uh, uh, Larry Cooperly last night is that in section six, uh, it should also apply to any students who are receiving public funding. Right now, the way that it reads, or at least in the version I have in front of me, is that it would only apply to public school students. And we wanna make sure that it, uh, the language we previously suggested is a student enrolled in a public school or a private school program in which the institution is receiving public dollars for all or part of that student's tuition. Um, we really want to make sure that that language uh, is, is in the bill. And that right now will go in section six. Yeah. Jim Damore, do you have a, a comment on that? On section six, addressing our students that are publicly funded in independent schools. Um, I don't particularly have a comment on that. Um, I suppose if they 
need though, if the independent schools need to change their policy just for the public students on public tuition, they probably need to change their policy for all students. Uh, I would imagine it'd be hard for them to have different policies for different students based on payment. Um, so it might have a broader effect on the independent schools. Um, but that's a policy question, not a legal question. Is that better as a question to the advisory group? Well, remember, this is just talking about the suspension expulsion piece for eight-year-olds and younger. That, that section is specifically about that. So what we're saying is that if, uh, if a private school or therapeutic school is receiving public dollars, they should be held the same rules, that they can suspend or expel a kid who is a safety you know, risk, but not for any other reason same as it is for public schools that's the, as far as i'm reading this that would be the only change that public that a private uh, program would have to make many of which already don't do that just like most public schools don't expel kids that are eight years and younger but we just feel that it needs to be the same for all vermont kids yeah. so i misunderstood you um jay um so what you're really saying i think is you want to apply this to approved independent schools that's correct jim yeah. That's, that's, that, that is a policy question. That's got a lot of tentacles, doesn't it? <laughs> um, Representative Brady. While we're on that section, can I, we all just put our eyes on it here and make sure we're okay? Because that's, a, I think, a bigger change, which, which was suggested by the folks at UVM. But so this is um, section six. So we're on page 13, um, D we changed it in this version so that it's not just expulsion, but it's also suspension, right. getting, getting rid of that under eight because of testimony we heard from AOE last week that expulsions were so rare. And uh, the folks at UVM offered, I thought important insight that if we leave it just as expulsion, it might not really move the needle very far. And I think they would wanna get at that from age eight up as well. But I just want to make sure while we're in this phase, so we don't run into this being a sticky point later, that that we're okay with that change there. So on line six, suspended or expelled. I'm looking out to the people in the room. Yeah, I'm looking out to um, the NEA. I'm looking out to the V's. I'm looking to Joanne. Yeah. Yeah, Joanne and I actually had a, a conversation about this a couple of days ago as well. Mm -hmm. um, Representative Brady, and you know, when we saw the language <clears throat> expel in there without the language suspend, we were wondering what the intent of the committee was, and we planned on raising that. Uh, okay. Expulsion in Vermont means 90 days at the end of the calendar year, whatever's greater, and suspension obviously is completely different. But then we saw that in this version that Jim had already made that change. Uh, you know, we hadn't suggested it, but we totally understand where they're coming from. And you're right, expulsion for kids eight and under. 25 years I've been doing this, I don't know of any. Okay. Oh. We'll, we'll flag that as a- I think Joanne's trying to up. speak, but, but she's muted. Excuse me? I I'm think sorry, Joanne's Hi. Hi. I'm so worried about regarding the um, eight-year-olds and younger is whether there needs to be some language in there that recognizes that the Vermont school disciplinary laws and processes um, that apply as well as the state and federal protections for students who have disabilities or who have a suspected disability um, apply in considering suspensions for students who are younger than eight as they apply to other students as well. I mean, the protections aren't clear in this section to me at least regarding students who are eight years old and younger. It's more permissive. I, it reads more permissively than, um, uh, than I would like to see, that we would like to see. You know, without the added protections. I would imagine that any eight-year-old that is in this predicament is also probably gonna be immediately referred for an evaluation. Well, when, one, one would hope, um, you yeah. know, unless there are circumstances that could indicate otherwise. Yeah. Yes. 
Um, but I am aware of I am aware of children younger than eight being threatened with the police in school meetings. So I, I don't think we can assume that one assumes that these protections apply when that language um, just looks more permissive than it is. Representative Conlon. Uh, uh, two questions. Um, I guess one immediately for Joanne, and that is, are you saying that the language that we have is more permissive than you would like to see, or are we referring to federal language? No, no, I was referring to the language in this bill that doesn't include the protections um, that are there for all students in actual fact, in terms of processing any kind of expulsion. I mean, it doesn't refer to any of the process or procedures that apply to any child. And then in, and particularly in the case of younger kids that are younger than eight, what about any suspected disability or actual disability? Um, okay, I, uh, from I a late- We're all thinking about that, but I just wonder whether there couldn't be a sentence that that, that this recognizes the protections that are in place legally. Does notwithstanding do that at all, yeah. Jim Demery? I'm not sure what we're notwithstanding. I think it's more consistent oh, with. Yeah. Um, but. Okay, I, I, as a layman, not being immersed in this world, to me, ours looks very um, non-permissive and very clear cut, unless you're talking about how do you define posing a threat of harm or danger to others? And that's, I assume, where the issue is. Right, right. Oh, okay, great. Um, and I guess I, I just wanted to. Are you poking a child with a permit uh, with a pencil? Yeah. Is that dangerous behavior? I mean, the, an act as simple as that can have very, very different interpretations. We Thank might you. flag this, this this issue for additional conversation within the small group, but Wendy Geller. Thank you, Chair Webb. Um, I was wondering if you folks might be able to offer some um, me some clarification. I I heard some language just a couple moments ago about the um, approved independent schools. Yes. Um, could you help me understand the the pro the proposed um, the suggestion at hand? Um, I, I ask because currently we don't collect these data from the approved independents, and it would be. Um, it, it would be quite a substantial undertaking to begin doing so. Um, so I, I, I just was wondering if I misheard or maybe you could say a little more about that to help me understand. I don't think you misheard. <laughs> okay. Uh, that was where my question lay. I, I yeah. am assuming the independent schools as Jay clarified is only to deal with section six, does not have to do with data collection at all. Um, and I guess I just wanted to voice my support for that as well as recommend that we get probably some feedback from the independent schools folks, if, if this would even be an issue for them, which I doubt. I would say we'd have to hear from the independent schools. <laughs> uh, excuse me, Representative Austin. Yep, I'm just wondering in that last sentence, uh, line 7D, where it says expel the student if the student poses a threat of harm or danger to others in school, can we have uh, can we add self and or danger to others in school? I mean, a lot of times, um, you know, kid, little kids who would just run out of school, you know, they'll just run out of school. I'm just, I, it's not just protecting other kids; it's also making sure that student is safe as well. This is referring to suspending or expelling them. You're saying that that would be an added protection to a student who might oh, be threatened. On that last themselves. sentence, it says that the school may suspend or expel the student if the student poses a threat of harm or danger to others in the school. But I think it should say poses a threat of harm or dangers to self and or others. You're saying you'd like to see them have the ability to expel or suspend a student who might be posing a threat to themselves. Yes, until we can, that plan can get into place. Until you know, yeah. Boy, that, that doesn't sit well with me. I, yeah, it seems like what you—that's what you wouldn't want to do. Yeah. Well, what would you do if a student is out of control and refusing to stay in the school? 
expel them. I'm not sure I would expel them. <laughs> well, I don't know the, the word expel. It's, it's mainly, I think, of putting them in their parents' care until we can figure out a plan to keep them in school. But I've chased, I don't know about Jay, but I've chased a few kids um, mm -hmm. around the neighborhood who just refused. They just left running. So, you know, anyway, that's, it's not just others that they throw, you know, they, they, they pose a threat to themselves, especially for under eight year olds. And you, and you, you think that expelling them might be a good way to handle it. I don't know. I don't like, well, I don't, what other way would you handle it? Would you keep them in a team school? together? <laughs> keeping them, I'd be bringing a team together, keeping them safe, keeping, there's a whole lot of things I would do right. before I, I remove the child. I would make child. sure they're safe and be, and putting a team together. I'm sorry, I'm gonna back off, go back to <laughs> pulling this okay. group together. I'm gonna to flag that as an area for discussion. Okay. Representative Brady, if you can also look at that one as well, um, I'm sure that we can reach out to some of the independent schools with the independent school group, I imagine that that will not be well received. Um, it, it, it's something to consider. Um, and I also don't wanna slow this building. Anything else? That's a lot. Did anybody else wanna to, want to say anything else? Joanna, did I see you? Yes, yeah. I just wanted to applaud the changes that you've made in terms of the, both in terms of the name and in terms of the representation. I had just written up a whole piece about the, the MTA, the multi-tiered system of supports around social and emotional growth and behavior and the, and the quality work that the best team has done. And so I was very delighted to see the best team represented um, because I think there is so much data that they have pulled together that's very valuable to look at, including the fact that the, the PBIS schools have shown a dramatic decrease since coming on board in terms of um, suspensions. Um, and for the exemplar schools, as little as 1.6% in the last report. So I think that's very important for, for um, uh, the committee um, to look at and also appreciate the, the uh, addressing and raising the question of LGBTQ students I think is really critical. And I think the best team would also help with a framework when people are presented with so many ideas in terms of what might be implemented in terms of interventions that to have a framework for addressing whether this is something that applies at the universal level, the targeted level, the intensive level, or applies to staff training. All of those components need to be tailored um, at the right level of intervention. So I was very glad to see um, that, that being addressed as well. Um, and I think, I think that was it. It just seems that some very good work has happened um, within the, the context of reviewing this bill and that um, all of the, the excellent testimony that came through um, has really made an impact on um, the strength of this bill. Thank you. Um, I wanna thank the agency for um, pointing out the uh, incredible data that you do collect and trying to figure out how we might best use it to inform our work. Um, and I think that you raised some good points that we'll try to sort out and very much appreciate um, Representative Brady trying to corral that information. Mm -hmm. Given that we can't just easily go off in the cafeteria and hammer it out the way we typically would. Um, anything else? Okay, I'd like to just take a little break before we go um, back to S114. I also know that um, Emily Simmons is coming in at three and she'll have a, a chance to comment on this as well. Um, and so how about a five minute break? Is that good? Five minute break. So that means that I'll see you 
we'll make it. We'll, why don't we make it? Uh, why don't we make it two twenty? Uh, two twenty-five. We'll be back. Thank you, everyone.